Hello everybody, welcome to Red Tool House. On today's video, we're going to demonstrate how we take our blades off our sawmill, get them sharp so they'll be ready to go for the next log that we have. So come check it out. So it's been a week or longer since I've last run the mill, and the blade that I have on here probably could go another log uh, without being sharpened, but it's, it's getting close to being due anyway, so we're going to take it off and get it on the sharpener. Now you can see here there's uh, quite a bit of rust buildup, so that, uh, that could be an issue in our sharpener. And um, I leave the blades on. It's, it's not a huge issue. There's just surface rust. But I'll show you a, a quick trick on how I get it cleaned off. So the combination of running on the uh, steel guide wheels and of course the uh, wire brush here allowed most of that rust to be taken off. There's still a little bit, but that takes the majority of it off, takes off any high points, any uh, sap buildup. Now I know you may think, Troy, that's not the smartest thing in the world to do to stick your hand near that blade. Keep in mind, I'm on the back side of the blade, behind the frame, and I'm reaching through with a wooden wire brush. So the cutting surface is on the front this way, and my hand is a good 10 to 12 inches further back. If the blade would even jump, it's not coming back, it's going forward. So it's, it's fairly safe. Now obviously the whole issue is if I go forward, if I trip and fall in, stumble over whatever, that's, that's a big issue. But sawmill is inherently dangerous to begin with, so those type of issues can always be um, something to deal with. So let's take the blade off. And as always, it looks like the mice have built a nest. Go away for a week from the mill and they build a nest. It's supposed to be the happening place to hang out. I'm taking tension off the blade here, of course, so I can get it off the wheel easy. Allows me to taking this guide wheel and just pushing it in by taking the tension off. all that fun stuff. Ants are building a nest in the mice nest. <laughs> Crack myself in the big nose with that. All right, so we got our blade off. Let's go in the shop and show you how we put an edge back on this. So Norwood sent me this sharpener. It's one of two that they offer. Uh, this would be what I'd call the base model. And said, hey, yeah, Troy, obviously try this out. Let us know what you think. And in full disclosure, about 20 years ago, I bought one of these things when I had my Lumbermate 2000, and I loved it. It worked out great. So uh, they didn't really have to twist my arm on saying whether or not it was going to work well. But I want to show you just how simple this is. Now I'm setting this up on my table saw, simply because that's the clearest, cleanest workbench that I have which is an indictment against me more than it is anything else. But just uh, the way this thing's made, it can, uh, it has different mounting brackets on it you can add. So if you're we're going to put it in a workbench vise, you could clamp it down. Obviously, I'm just using the flat bottom so I can clamp it using F clamps just to the rail of my table. So I'm not clamping it to the tabletop itself. 
just to the fence rail here. So it makes it nice and secure and it gives me a clear area to work with here. So in a video we did uh, quite a few months back, actually I believe it was these this still cold weather winter months, uh, talking about when and how we determine when a blade is dull. Of course, what we do, what are the options that you can do with your blades when they're dull? Uh, whether it's send them out to be sharpened, sharpen them yourselves, or obviously throw them away and get new ones. We kind of talked about that and even what I use to identify um, a dull blade and the protocols I go through and, and swapping them out. So if, if you want to check that out, I'll link to it here. But uh, obviously, in building up after that video, we want to show that what we do here at Red Toolhouse is we put our dull blades on our Norwood sharpener to get them back ready to go back on the mill. So you can see, pretty simply, just talking here, um, a little bit of a sawdust build up there, so I had to pry it loose, that this blade simply just rests on top of this mechanism. Uh, put it inside this channel. I'll get you some close-ups here in a second. Put it inside this channel. And then, of course, these guides that are set. And these guides, uh, the instructions come with details of how far you want to set the guides depending on the size of your blade, so forth and so on. So what is the basic makeup of this sharpener? Well, it's, it's kind of simple, but there's definitely some engineering involved in it. There are, um, there are the arms, of course, that keep the blade on a singular plane, so it's a flat surface, tabletop, but it allows it to rotate. There's this crank mechanism that, as you crank it, is advancing the blade around. So it's like a little tiny train track kind of thing where we're just one tooth at a time, we're advancing this blade around so each tooth can be introduced to the business end, the sharpening end here. There is a cam mechanism inside this, a cam wheel, that's based upon the blade's pitch and set and all those type of things, number of teeth per inch. If you look at a saw blade, it'll have a TPI number, that's teeth per inch. It'll also have a, a pitch or a set that determines you know, kind of the hook, the rake, all those type of things associated with the actual cutting surface of the teeth. So knowing that these are Norwood blades, um, they're kind of their default is what, what I ordered, then the cam mechanism on this is the default cam. So we're going to stick with that. I didn't have to change that out. But they offer other cams for other of their blades or even blades that aren't theirs, uh, other other manufactured blades that, uh, that you can use. So this isn't just uh, singular function for just Norwood uh, blades that they sell. Well, the component that I, that I have elevated here that really gets everything done, of course, is this Dremel tool. So they've got a Dremel tool uh, with an engineered mount and a swing arm here that rests on this cam wheel. So as I turn this handle, it not only advances the blade per tooth, but it raises and lowers the Dremel tool. So the idea is to get contact with the face of the tooth and then with the gullet or the back of the tooth. So you're actually sharpening both sides. So other key elements of this sharpening device, of course, are these adjustment knobs. So there's a knob here and there's a knob here. And what that does is, is that kind of sets the distance, the amount of drop that the Dremel tool is going to come down and also the point in which it starts to drop. So as it rides up the cam, uh, you, you, you imagine this thing's kind of going up a ski slope and coming down the face, going up the ski slope, coming down the face, going up the ski slope, coming down the face each time it's trying to sharpen. But what we want to do, per Norwood's recommendations, don't try to do both at the same time. We're going to do two passes, two rotations on the blade here, and we're going to start with sharpening the face, get all the faces sharpened, and then we're going to come back and we're going to sharpen the back or the gullet. So I know most of you that watch probably know this already, but uh, just for those that maybe don't, you know, how does a saw blade even work? How do these bandsaw blades work? Well, each tooth, if you imagine, is a tiny little chisel. So as it's passing through the log uh, at a high rate of speed, and of course lots of teeth, then it's slowly chiseling away a portion of material. So the face of this tooth, where it comes to a point, is the chisel end. And then of course the back is what we call the back of the tooth or the gullet. So the face would be the business end that's doing all the work. So this, this vertical coming down from the point. And then the back or the gullet would be the, the valley coming up the back of the face to the tip of the tooth. So as this tooth travels this way and travels through the wood, then this surface is, is chiseling off those portions of, of material. 
So why bother, why not just sharpen the face, and why bother with the gullet? Well, according to Norwood and other things that I've read, it's important to remove any stress fractures that may start in these areas. So cleaning up the gullet, cleaning up the back, just makes a good true uh, surface. It takes out the, uh, any type of small fractures, any hairline cracks that could then lead to the tooth breaking off. And of course, just like with a, when you sharpen a chisel, you sharpen the, the front of the chisel, but you also come back to hone it. You kind of turn what's called turning the burr. So you know, naturally, there'll be a burr that builds up. So as we come back off of that little ski slope there, as we climb this little mountain and, uh, and clear off the back of that, then we're going to turn that burr and make this point even sharper. So I want to give you a close-up of how this works. Um, and again, since I'm not engaging yet, I'm not actually on or sharpening. I don't have my adjustments down. You can see as I'm turning that handle, that Dremel tool is up, the tooth is advanced, and now the Dremel tool rides down. So you can see here how that Dremel tool is going up and down. If it was making contact with the face, so it's up, not touching anything, the mechanism advances the blade, and now as this advancing mechanism gets out of the way, that Dremel tool is starting to come down and surface that face. And then once we've done all of that, as we come back around, then this next step, as it's advancing the tooth, then we actually want the, the Dremel tool to be you know, riding up the back side of that. Apologize for all the distraction of stuff behind. It's kind of tough to focus on an area. So when I put the blade on this mechanism and I have it out like this, it gives me a really good opportunity to look down and do a quick inspection for any damage. If I see any tooth broken off because some dummy ran it into the guides on the sawmill, or if I've you know hit some metal, or just you know, overall wear and tear of the blade after using it so many times, maybe the, uh, the teeth have become weak and some have broken off. So I can do a quick inspection like that, but then I can also look at both sides, the inside and outside of the blade, and address any buildup. So uh, as we mentioned, leaving this on the, on the mill, it developed a little bit of surface rust. And the only reason why I'm taking this off or, and just giving it a light, a light sanding here uh, with, a, with an old used disc is as it's passing through this plate mechanism, I don't want anything to gum up and foul this advancement. If, if this doesn't advance exactly the way we want, then obviously that Dremel tool can come down and end up taking the head right off of a tooth, which is what we don't want to happen. So having a nice clean blade to advance through the system is going to make um, the system work properly and of course keep from damaging your blade. So you know, not only rust, but any sap, any pitch like that could build up. Now you may say, well Troy, why don't you just take it right off the sawmill when you're done with your last log and bring it in here and sharpen it. Well, yeah, I could do that. Um, I normally don't sharpen one blade at a time. I normally wait till I have four or five that need to be done and then do that. So there's times that the, the blades will kind of hang out, or if I bring them in here, they're, they're up against the wall. And so they can get some surface rust just because, you know, they're not a finished surface. So they can get some rust built up on them. So it's good to just inspect each one each time. One other thing I like to do just for reference is I'll take my Sharpie and I'll just make a mark, kind of a starting point. Um, you can also look for the weld, weld line on the blade. Uh, but for me, that's not as easy to spot as my Sharpie mark. And then I also like to make a mark on the inside at the same starting point, simply because as it goes around, I can see the mark from the inside and the outside as it, it, it comes around shows me both sides. So that just gives me a reference so I know, okay, I've, I've removed enough material of the face, now it's time to adjust for the back.
So as you can see, coming around, doing the whole loop there, there are some minor adjustments I have to make on the fly. Uh, obviously, anything that's mass produced, these blades, um, you know, we're, we're talking microns, well, not microns, you know, smaller than millimeters of, 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 of material that we're removing. So we, we have to have that consistency through. So this is the first time this blade has been on the sharpener. And so this sharpener with its repetitive motion is obviously kind of truing up these teeth as it goes along. So the more I sharpen these blades, the more I'll be able to dial it in based upon the cam rotation and that type of stuff. Now you may be wondering, why can't you just sit there with uh, the Dremel tool and just sharpen it yourself? You actually could. Um, the, the whole point of this is to give a repetitive motion to be consistent. If you sit here, um, in honest, all honesty, I've done it by hand in the past. If you just sit here by hand and do it, you can get a decent edge on it. It takes a lot of time. And then, of course, you have the uh, opportunity of removing too much material, which will wear down the use of your teeth faster and uh, make your blade useless. Or you'll just be inconsistent. And you can have some areas that are sharp, some, uh, some areas that aren't. And, um, and, and, and that will show up when you go to cut. So we've got the face cut. So let's come back and make our adjustments and let's get the back and the gullet cleaned up. Okay, so I've got uh, the face done, I've got the backside done. Went around a little bit more there as I was getting the adjustments. You can see in some of that close-up footage, as the blade starts to match the shape and form of the cam, then we'll have better constant contact throughout. So we'll even start to clean up the very bottom of the valley or the gullet there. But right now we've got uh, the tooth in really good shape. Those are quite pointy. So um, I'm gonna take this guy off and I'm gonna put him in the sharp pile. Ouch, without poking holes in my hand. <laughs> this is why you plug the Dremel tool in on the outside of the saw blade. <clears throat> Ow, dang, go on that thing sharp. <clears throat> I should be wearing gloves. So I've got to get a better uh, organization system here for my blades that are uh, dull, but you can kind of see that's what I have here on my rack. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I believe. Yeah, eight, nine, ten. Got three in the sharp pile, seven in the dull pile. And uh, so we're going to move on to the next. Now, since I've set the system up to work on the gullet in the back, then there's no sense in readjusting that and tearing that adjustment down. We'll put the blade on and obviously do that part first and then second pass we'll do the face. But I'm going to go outside to release this because I don't like doing it around all my equipment. It could damage teeth. Oh, ow, oh my, God, good. Ow, two second, dead, Ugh. And there we go, just a simple process of unfolding that blade. Now, <laughs> I will uh, will say that um, a smart guy would be wearing gloves doing this, 
because uh, it's raining right now, so that's why my blade's now wet, would be wearing gloves right now. The dull blades are still a little sharp. But my goodness, once you get a blade sharp, it doesn't jerk the hide off that pinky knuckle there. So I know the question that everyone's asking right now. Okay, Troy, yeah, that's fancy pants. What are the what's the cost associated with it? Now this is not an inexpensive device. Uh, this is, I believe, about seven hundred bucks, seven and a half. I'll post the price below in the details. But the um, the real thing is to look at the return on investment of this. So we we talked in the previous video about how blades are uh, you know, twenty five, twenty eight, thirty dollars a piece, depending on which type you get. So um, Having a blade to be able to resharpen and sharpen and sharpen and stay true and stay consistent is going to pay off in the long run. If you imagine, you know, I've got a box of, uh, see, 10 blades and another box of five. So I think at some point I've got 15, 17 blades, something like that. So those blades should last me a very, very long time as long as I'm using this sharpener and getting a good, true sharpen. Again, if I was even doing that by hand, I could wear these teeth down faster. So uh, using this this machine with its consistency will allow me to get the most life out of my blades. And you know, one thing, I've never done it, but one thing you could look at, if you have sawyers in your area, other guys that have um, bandsaw blades, you could either go in and share the expense of this device and share it amongst one another, or you could buy it yourself and say, hey guys, just pay me a small fee for sharpening, and it would still be cheaper than them sending it off to get sharpened because they wouldn't have to handle shipping. So you could possibly start to recoup some of your investment back there as well. So how much time are we talking about to actually sharpen one of these blades? Well, I've never actually really um, tracked that. So we're going to do that on this one. Since I've kind of got it set up already, we'll take that into consideration. But blade number two through the system, I'm going to uh, start my stopwatch. Or stop, stop my stopwatch. I'm going to start my stopwatch, and we'll see how this goes. Okay, so twice around the horn and taking time to do my adjustments. Ooh, that's sharp. Uh, in between uh, for the, 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 the face and the back, looking at six minutes and 45 seconds there. And you saw the entire time lapse. That's it in its entirety. And uh, that turkey is sharp. So uh, you can see it, it really doesn't take long to do that. I'm excited about that. You know, the what I got seven blades left, I believe. So that would be, um, you know, 42 minutes. So less than an hour, I could have my entire complement of blades back up and ready to go. So um, really like how this works. You may be wondering, okay, Troy, with a broken tooth, does this negate the whole thing? Well, I've run into that before. I actually have a blade right behind the camera that's broken. It's got a broken tooth on it because somebody hit the guide again. That's twice. Um, it broke a couple teeth off. So in this situation where I'm advancing it, there's actually enough of the tooth that the little advancing pin will still be able to grab. But even in that situation, uh, if you had multiple teeth and they were sheared off clean for some reason, then you could still just advance it by hand and work way through it. Because obviously you're not going to sharpen those. It's not like you need to have the uh, Dremel tool dropping down exactly since they're gone. And of course, it gets to a certain point where you're missing so many teeth, you want to just get rid of that anyway because that's an extra strain on your mill. One or two teeth broken here or there, not that big a deal. But if you had a section of five, maybe ten of them gone because you're really slammed into something hard, then it's time to retire that blade and get it out of rotation. Well, one more adjustment that a good sawyer should do to his blades is readjust or reset the set. And uh, we're not going to do that. I actually have a tooth setter from Norwood that they gave me. We're going to document that at some point. I haven't knocked any set out of the, these uh, blades yet. Uh, the time will come. Now, obviously, the one that hit the metal, it, it may be out of, out of set, so we'll have to check yet. But set, of course, is the angle of the teeth. If, uh, you know, if all of these teeth were all right behind one another, then there's a lot more opportunity for the blade to be pinched in the wood. So the set is what defines the thickness or the curve of the cut. So some of these teeth lean to the left, some of these teeth lean to the right, and some of them stay in the center. 
So sometimes when you run into something or you run a blade really dull, it can, it can get pinched and it can cause the set to come out of a tooth or come out of a blade. And sometimes just overuse over time makes that come out as well. So a set device similar to this will allow us to bend to specification those teeth back into the proper shape. Uh, so that's an upcoming video. Like I said, I want to get a couple blades without any set in them or damage set so we can really show how effective that is. So that may be um, on down the road. I'm going to post below the links to Norwood. Uh, again, I appreciate them partnering with me and sending me this sharpener. I appreciate the, you guys that have, have commented and, and sent me messages Let me know that you've purchased Norwood products. Again, I don't get any kickbacks for that. I just obviously get a chance to use their products. Uh, but I do appreciate you guys letting them know that if you call them, contact them, do any business with them, that you found, uh, you found them via Red Toolhouse or you Red Toolhouse motivated you to give them a call. Uh, that just obviously helps our relationship. Appreciate it. Well, there's my um, two-bit corporate marketing plug, right? All right, guys, we're going to um, sharpen up some more blades. It's raining cats and dogs right now, so there's no sense in going anywhere and doing anything else. But as soon as the sun comes out, we'll be making more sawdust. All right, take care, everybody. Still not putting on gloves, are you? Living dangerously.